I, I will present something that is, let's say, the core of the last chapter of the book. It's a um, discussion about, uh, about a, let's say, an alternative concept of recognition. Uh, I think that we, you will see how this concept is influenced by a certain Lacanian lecture, no? uh, presupposed here. No? Actually, I, I have written a book some years ago uh, trying to defend that uh, it's not correct to say that recognition is a, is a, a major concept for Lacan just at the beginning, uh, just at, uh, until the 50s. Uh, I think that the, is a uh, concept very important to understand the rationality of the clinical uh, uh, practice in Lacanian perspective until the end, even if the concept is not totally, uh, 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 say, uh, named uh, by, uh, by, by Lacanian texts. Uh. Then, uh, with this idea in mind, I tried in these last years to develop this concept as a more broad uh, perspective, especially trying to show, let's say, its uh, political implications, the consequences. Uh. And the, the, the core of the <clears throat> this conference is about, uh, let's say, these implications. Uh. And uh, I would like to, to begin um, remembering that uh, in the philosoph philosophical and social debates that have taken place of, uh, over the last 20 years, we have seen the concept of recognition attain hegemonic status, functioning as a central operator for any understanding of the rationality underlying political demands. First revisited in the 30s through Alexander Kozhev's reading of Hegel and its development in, among others, the psychoanalysis of Lacan and the philosophical thought of Jean Polit, Georges Bataille, Maurice Merleau-Ponty, and later Jean-Paul Sartre, the concept was not systematically explored in its properly political dimension until the early 90s. Still, None of the political theorists that attended Kozhev's lectures on the subject, among them uh, Raymond Leron and Eric Weil, became known for systematically exploring the potentialities of the theory of recognition. In fact, the potentialities inherent to its political application would not receive a considerable boost of any sort until the publication of Axel Honneth's struggle for recognition in 92, and Charles Taylor, multiculturalism exam examining the pol policy of recognition of 94. Starting with these authors, Hegel's concept of anerkennung seemed at long last to provide a normative orientation to the progressive development of social struggles. Still no adequate reflection on contemporary political applications of the concept of recognition would be possible without an evaluation of the social historical context surrounding its rediscovery in the 90s. Such con context is undissociable from the loss of centrality over the past few decades of this class struggle discourse as an interpretive key when it comes to social conflicts. The notion of class struggle seemed to reduce social conflicts to general problems related to the egalitarian redistribution of wealth, problems that are not merely expression of a theory of redistributive justice. Thus, uh, this perspective sh uh, would ignore moral and cultural dimensions that could not possibly be understood as simply echoing class structures. That being the case, it seems plausible to state that a certain accumulation of change has provided the conditions that allowed for a promotion of the question of recognition to a central position as a political problem. Among such chains, three may be said to be fundamental. The first one is the weakening of the proletariat as historical agents towards revolutionary social transformation. 
This has been an important issue for the Frankfurt School, at least since the 30s, and a feature of its research into the sort of political regression that ultimately lead the working classes to support Nazism. The integration of workers, starting in the 50s, into social security programs, as well as into the corrective policies of so-called welfare state, doubtlessly contributed to the consolidation of this particular diagnosis. Of particular note is the way, for example, Habermas, noticing the scarcity of candidates while willing to operate as global agents for revolutionary change after such working class integration, and the subsequent weakening of the welfare state itself, insist on reading the situation as an expression of the exhaustion of, I quote, a particular utopia that in the past crystallized, uh, crystallized around the potential of a society based on social labor. It is this exhaustion that leads Axel Hornet to state no long ago that uh, the belief in a privilege role for the working class within revolutionary politics was nothing but a historical philosophical dogma. Once such assumption is accepted, any and all investment in the class struggle discourse as a central axis for the organization and constitution of identities within political dispute is necessarily sapped of its strength and consequently, space is clearly for new candidates willing to perform this function. Yet the current centrality of the concept of recognition could not be consolidated until the aforementioned loss of faith in the revolutionary role of the proletariat was accompanied, accompanied by an additional phenomenon related to a transformation of the system of expectations connected to something fundamental for the development of political struggle, namely the universe of labor. According to Luc Boutansky and Eve Capello, such transformation, beginning with, with the May 60 week protests, may be understood to entail the formation of a new capitalist ethos. The social critic that originates in the period had labor itself as its most significant object in its inability to meet social demands for authenticity. Seen as a sphere of rigidity, rigidity of imposed schedules and controlled time, of stereotypical entrepreneurial hierarchies and tailorist alienation, labor had been strongly devalued by the youth of 68. The result of that critic would be the reconfiguration of the ideological core of capitalist society and the attendant transformation of the ethos of labor. Values such safety, stability, and respect for functional hierarchy and specialization Values that had once made of the universe of labor a fundamental sector of, for the imposition of rigid, rigidly fixed identities gave way to a different set of values derived directly from the dimension of the critic of labor. Risk-taking -take, ability, flexibility, malleability, and the deterritorialization that results from infinite process of re-engineering, all of them values that compose labor's new ideological nucleus today. Through the change in question, the universe of labor in capitalist society would be more apt in acknowledging demands for individual recognition and in altering the metrics of the experience of alienation, detaching such metrics from the team 
of economic expoliation so as to reposition it near to the theme of the imposition of an inauthentic mode of existence that is a life bereft of the space where the minimum requirements for a self-realization may be developed. This transition from spoliation to inauthenticity at the heart of the critic of labor was an additional ven venue through which the concept of class struggle could be made secondary and the problem of recognition given centrality as a political device. Finally, the third point, it must be recalled how this change meets another series of chains connected in turn to an understanding first arrived at in the 70s that the struggles of historically vulnerable social groups, groups often deprived of fundamental rights, such as blacks, gays, or women, were struggles for the cultural affirmation of difference. This is to say that they were not merely understood as segments of a broader struggle toward extending universal rights to groups that had, up to that point, been excluded, but as process engaged in the affirmation of difference in light of a supposedly, supposedly universalist framework, ultimately committed to the perpetuation of norms and modes of living peculiar to culturally hegemonic groups. Such chains are much to the development of themes connected to multiculturalism. Still, this interpretation does not correspond to the historical reality of the resurgence of the concept of recognition within social philosophy. I would like to give, let's say, a, an alternative interpretation that's not this one with these three main topics. No? As we have seen, it was only in the early 90s, in books written by Honneth and Taylor, that the concept was first revisited. At the exact moment, when the slow disintegration of the economic achievements of the so-called welfare state begins, with the progressive dismantling of workers' rights, the partial or complete privatization of social security, and the deterioration of education, health, and other public service. Such disintegration took place at a moment when several theoreticians stated that we are about to enter a post-ideological era, that is, one era marked by the demise of the belief in revolutionary social transformations, with the consequent acceptance of the normative horizon of liberal democracies as the end point of social struggle. That may explain why those who are critical to the importance given to the concept of recognition have often insisted that what we are faced with here is but a compensatory concept. For them, the situation is one where, given the impossibility of implementing effective policies relating to related to wealth redistribution or to radical attacks aimed at inequality, all that remains is to discuss compensatory policies of recognition. Likewise, given the known unquestionable status of capital as the sole instance capable of universal reach within the liberalism of multicultural societies, there would be little left for us to do save to reinventing demands for the recognition of communal identities in their various forms, in the attempt to bestow upon our communities a greater sense than simply that of a delimited space. Finally, given the impossibility of large-scale social transformation, there would be little left to do apart from discussing 
the moral nature of our social demands. Well, to demonstrate that we were not dealing with a mere compensatory device, but rather one imbued with significant transformative power concerning social structures, was a task to which several defenders of the political application of the concept of recognition turned to in the past 20 years. Such tasks involved clarifying how the emancipatory power of recognition was not unrelated to problems related to the egalitarian redistribution on, of wealth, which means reminding us that discussions on cultural difference and social identities do not necessarily mask structural problems connected to the struggle between, between classes for the redistribution of wealth. Tower accomplishing such project, Axel Honneth, for one, had been led to state that, I quote, even distributional injustice must be understood as the institutional expression of social disrespect, or better said, of unjustified relations of recognition. From that, he's also led to defend, among other positions, that even the workers' movements aimed in essential part at finding recognition for its traditions and forms of life within a capitalist value horizon. Honneth's strategy had at its foundation an attempt to assimilate the problem of wealth redistribution into a broader framework of discussions pertaining to recognition. Toward that end, it was required that the social sentiment of economic injustice be understood as a potential expression of, I quote, the motivational sources of social discontent and resistance, clearing the way, at least as far as Ronet was concerned, for the possible establishment of a unified motivational framework center on the idea that, I quote, what subjects expect of society is above all recognition of their identity, identity claims. A rather unsurprising position coming from an author who will also state that, I quote, subjects perceive institutional procedures as social injustice when they see aspects of their personality being disrespected with they believe or which they believe have a right to recognition. What is interesting in this point is that this, this introduces a concept of personal integrity to the regulating horizon of process of recognition. A concept whose fundamental presuppositions is the de facto naturalization of the structures of the psychological concept of individual and personality. According to Honet, political struggles, even those organized on the basis of demands for economic redistribution, ultimately aim to ensure that concrete conditions exist so one may build a personal identity. In other words, the very genesis of modern individuality is seen as, I think this is a very important point, is seen as a pre-political foundation for the political sphere. Something to be politically confirmed rather than politically deconstructed. Hence the following decisive statement, quote, I proceed from the premise that the purpose of social equality is to enable the personal identity formation of all members of society. Such natu naturalization being accomplished, Honneth is free to avail himself of, among other texts, studies by historians such as uh, 
such as Edward Thompson and Barrington Moore, in order to legitimize his viewpoint that the motivational structure of working class struggles was mainly based on, I quote, the experience of the violation of locally transmitted claims to honor as feelings of disrespect concerning the demands of living beings for recognition far out way why had material needs in importance. By insisting that the moral experience of the feeling of disrespect is the central engine that drives political struggle, promoting such feeling to the condition of motivational ground for the entirety of human conflict, Honneth is able to relocate redistribution and all associated problems to the general framework of moral demands. Thus, as social vulnerability is connected to impoverishment, understood mainly as the material expression of the one's complete inability to make moral demands for respect, the path is lies open for the following statement, I quote, the distinction between economic disadvantage and cultural degradation is phenomenologically secondary. Insofar as conflicts for redistribution are not to be understood as being independent of experiences of social disrespect. Among the many problems that result from this perspective, special consideration should be given to at least two. First of all, once one admits that demands for redistribution have a moral nature, Preventing such demands from being psychologized is no longer possible, which is to say treated as problems related to limitations in the development of one psychological individuality. This, in the final analysis, turns the entirety of political discourse into one pertaining mostly to complaints of a psychological nature, most significant, however, is the fact it turns every response to demands for redistribution into a therapeutic action derived from state policies that see political subjects as something akin to proto-subjects psychologically vulnerable in what concerns their identity. Woe's appearance in the public sphere is anchored on discourse peculiar to those who, deep down, expect to be taken care of and supported. In the end, demands for social change becomes demands for social care. There is yet a second problem to be found to the perspective defended by Honneth. By reducing the totality of social struggle to demands for the affirmation of the conditions allowing for the reconstruction of personal identity, his perspective obliterates a dimension that is fundamental for a proper understanding of class struggle, at least as far as Marx is concerned, namely that powerful non-identity that is peculiar to the Marxist notion of proletariat. By seeing the revolutionary potential of the proletariat as nothing but a historical philosophical dogma, Honneth ends up losing that which one might term the ontological function of the proletariat holds in Marx tough. Such function makes the proletariat the social manifestation of a principle of non-identity and indifferentiation. In a sense, a kind of proletarian condition may be found in Marx that operates a regulatory horizon for its radical egalitarianism, a condition that contemporary political reflection would gain much by re revisiting. Well, let us, let us remember how According to Marx, revolution comes only from the classes without qualities and without identity in a deeper way. A class constituted by 
I quote Marx, world historical, empirically universal individuals in the place of local ones. A notion with little connection to the perspective of workers struggling for the recognition of their tradition and lay ways of life. To consider workers as world historical individuals, a certain experience of negativity is required, which is a fundamental condition for the universality proposed since Hegel. Proletarians suffer such experience by the complete self-dispossession described by Marx in the following words. I quote Marx. The proletarian is without property. His relation to his wife and children has no longer anything in common with the bourgeois family relations. Modern industrial labor, modern subjection to capital, the same in England as in France, in America as in Germany, has stripped him of every trace of national character. Law, morality, religion are to him so many bourgeois prejudices behind which lurk in an ambush just as many bourgeois interests. Well, look, as we can see, Marx's definition of proletariat derives not only from the extreme impoverishment, but also from the complete annulment of its binds to traditional ways of life. In fact, political processes of self-reaffirmation do not recover these binds. Consequently, it is not the case to allow workers to constitute a nation or a bourgeois family or a morality or a state or even a religion. Such normativities are denied by a non-return negation. Nevertheless, this negation does not show proletariat as, I quote Marx, that wall undefined, dissolute, kicked about mass that the Frenchman styled la bohème, which Marx defi defined as lumpen proletariat. After all, the structuralist in, in the indefinite anomic condition of the lumpen proletariat comes from who conserves hopes for the return to the order or from who is unable to conceive some order beyond that which he knows completely lost. Position that makes his political action just as parodies of chains, comedies or even masquerades all terms that Marx, the 18 Brumaire, used to describe revolutions which are actually attempts to establish stabilization in chaos. Well, in the particular case of the proletariat, there is a, any expectation of return in the sense that destitute of property, nationality, binds of traditional ways of life, or even not trusted in established social normativities, can trans transform his own lack of original ground into a political force to a radical change of the ways of life. Then we cannot confound, confound the affirmation of proletarian condition with a certain form of claim for recognize, recognition of disrespects, disrespected ways of life clearly organized in its specificities. On the contrary, the affirmation of the proletarian condition generates the social class of subjects without predicate, which according to the German ideology will satisfy themselves hunting in the morning, fishing in the afternoon, rearing cattle in the evening, and criticize after dinner in a certain way, and that is the true point, that they are not restricted by to be only hunter or fisher or shepherd or even critic. That it, that is, sorry, it can happen in a certain way that the subject do not determine himself integrally in his predicate. It means that the activity of fishing, hearing cattle, criticizing, cannot be simultaneously identification of subjects. Similar to Hegel, the setting of subjects, its exteriorization, 
shows something radically anti-predicative animating the movement of his sense, essence. A conclusion not so different to Marx if we consider workers as the class that, I quote Marx, is in itself the expression of the dissolution of all classes within present society. Working class dissolute every other classes because it represents the complete loss of humanity, something that does not draw a figure in the present image of humanity. In this sense, and close to Regalian theory of subject, although it's true, Marx could criticize our assimilation, not in the morally abstract elaboration of the problem, but uh, what I would like to stress is that, that we can consider that the worker could not only overcome his own alienation, bringing himself face to face to the deeply undermined character of his ground, as well as conserving in himself something of this indetermination. According to Baliba, the arriving of proletariat as, pol as a political subject is the appearing of a subject as emptiness, which is not absolutely without practical determinations. If it is the case, we can affirm that Marx's struggle of classes are not simply a moral conflict promoted by the defense for material conditions proper to the symmetrical appraisal among subjects, able to conquer recognition from the perspective of the integrality of their personalities. The abolition of private property must walk necessarily side by side with the abolition of the a psychic economy based on the affirmation of personality as a category of identity. We can even say that proletariat is the political name of the social force for identitarian indifferentiation, whose recognition can completely disarticulate societies organized from the hypostasis of general relations of property. Marx was very successful in relating this concept of, to the juxtaposition of the political logic with sociological description, associating in a deep way real existing workers who constituted an important majority of the society, with the concept of proletariat. However, to sustain such relation is not the necessary condition for demonstrate the effectiveness of the Marxist concept of proletariat. In the present historical situation of reconfigured society of work, we should rethink such relation so that we can discover other places proper to the manifestation of claims based on an ontology of subject as presupposed by Marx's construction. I would like to finish uh, insisting, let's say, some political uh, consequence of this perspective. Because if we accept such hypothesis and such post-identitarian horizon, we must consider some recent alternatives to think a possible theory of recognition not restricted to a compensatory politics. In the debate with Axel Hornet, Nancy Fraser tries to solve such question, arguing for a certain dualism in which problems of redistribution and recognition, although overlap one another, could take in consideration the impossibility to reduce cultural spheres to economic one. Taking it in consideration, we can interpret such following affirmation, I quote, I, I quote Fraser, justice asks us to conceive cultural recognition and social equality in such a way that both of them can reinforce themselves in spite of obstacle one another, especially because economic and cultural injustice overlaps usually themselves in such a way that both are, are dialectically reinforced. In this sense, according to Fraser, 
An important challenge in theories of recognition would be produced if we articulate economic and cultural injustice. From this perspective, Nancy Fraser presents a distinction between two models of political action. There would be compensatory politics relating to dynamic of recognition and redistribution. For example, politics concerning with the perpetuation of the liberal welfare, as well as something that Fraser calls official multiculturalism. Moreover, we can add a consideration to Fraser's interpretation, making explicit that the articulation between economic liberalism and multiculturalism use the affirmation of cultural difference as a compensatory way to paralyze politics against social effects proper to liberal economic policies. In order to compensate such political paralysis, society figures itself as an ato atomized network of street identitarian groups dealing constantly their own recognition in a fragile dynamic of tolerance. We must say fragile dynamic of tolerance because cultural identities are, at least in this context, defensive constructions in that they are defined upon relations of opposition and exclusion. Cultural identities, such as this one related to the affirmation of the particularity proper to ways of life, is structured in, by ethnical groups, nationalities, religions, modes of sexuality, or even traditional system of habits, would define themselves under tension between identities and difference if we don't want to accept the typically liberal illusion of a pluralism without antagonism. An illusion based on forgetting that political and psychological identities are constructed within asymmetrical relations of power making them expressions of strategies of defense or domination. The sensibility to such antagonism would become less intense only by the consolidation of a strongly equalitarian space beyond cultural difference, rather than by an extreme politicization of the cultural field. We can find some convergences between such demands and Fraser belief on the existence of radical policies which articulates, I quote, socialist practice of redistribution which practice of the construction of cultural difference. Such deconstructions appear as a necessity because we can create new forms of solidarity and equality resulting from the conception of subjects as supports of this, the constructive practice able to modify structurally the system of social representation, constituting multiple differences in constant movement. The failure to establish myself within a rigid identity, but to recognize the need to deal with something I do not completely understand in terms of identity, would take me to greater solidarity with what, on the other, I am unable to integrate. If such new forms of solidarity would work, then they could eliminate the morally compensatory character proper to politics of cultural recognition, because those new forms of relationship wouldn't allow that the regressive dynamic of identitarian conflict rides the political impossibility to change the economically re economical reality. According to Fraser, this new solidarity could eliminate the regressive dynamic of such cultural conflicts, opening space to a substantial sharing of subjective discomforts derived from aesthetic identities. That is, instead of simply remove, removing the cultural clashes of discussions related to politics, we see a tendency that seeks to prevent that the debate about culture do not enter into a regression dominated by issues 
relating to the recognition of the production of identities. Well, nevertheless, I would like to evaluate the possibility to argue for a relative different tendency. Maybe the problem does not consist only to dissociate culture to identity, but go further and insist on the necessity of a theory of recognition able to dissociate politics to culture. The debate about the relation between the redistribution and the recognition reduce social relations to two fields, culture and economics. However, it is necessary to add politics as an autonomous field, because maybe it's impossible to separate culture for, from the production of defensive identities. But we must evaluate the possibility to affirm politics rising from something that we ca can call potency of depersonalization. I would like to finish with this topic. I would like to defend that the political field must be differentiated from cultural and economical fields. A possible consequence from such consideration states that identities can and should find then their own space for development, but without politicized displays. Actually, politics disidentifies subjects from their cultural difference, displaces them from their nationalities or geographical identities, and even they individualize them from their psychological attributes. Above all, politics is a force of the differentiation able to open a productive field of social indetermination. Political subjects do not support individual representative claims of certain particular groups or classes. Under such conditions, claims that appear in the political field are only the emulation of singularities trying to inscribe themselves into a simple game of force, rather than a very political confrontation with a concrete force for change. Actually, politics ignores individuals, and perhaps this is one of the most contemporary Marx teaching. A political point of view, we should say that uh, we should say that a political point of view is that one that they that create a space of cultural. No, uh, it's uh, a political point of view. It's um, it's uh, someone that create a space, let's say, of absolute cultural indifference. However, what really means the proposition that states cultural difference as an object of political indifference? At first, we should remember what it doesn't mean. We cannot ignore that particular programs for affirmative action plays a strategic role, nor that laws in defense of historically more vulnerable social groups such as women, immigrants, homosexual, travestis, refugees, must strategically state cultural difference in order to strengthen the social sensibility to particular, the particular vulnera vulnerability of such groups. Nevertheless, in this case, we are talking about the plasticity that political action has to impose to real conditions which ensure the assertion of egalitarianism. And one of these conditions is the construction of the awareness of the vulnerability of groups historically dispossessed. In such case, we can talk about a strategically provisory use of the notion of identity. Moreover, affirming cultural difference as objects of political indifference means to argue for the autonomy of politics in relation to culture as well to, as to economy. Such autonomy derives from the belief in the fact that only the political field can affirm itself as a radical equality field in the extent that the cultural and economic field will always characterize themselves by the inequalities able to be attenuated, although never eliminated at all. If it's true that there is a social dynamic of cultural characterized 
of culture characterized by the affirmation of the multiplicity of constantly changing difference, then we can conclude too that there is a potency of fragmentation and differentiation haunting the economic field. From Hegel's outlines of philosophy of right, we can admit that the circulation of wealth and properties in the sphere of the so civil society among individuals will always produce inequalities, even that the function of state would be attenuate or control them. Actually, we can find alternative ways beyond the free market economy. We can open a social space where common good can circulate in a more effective way and where it's possible to consider the common ownership. However, the principle of accumulation is inherent to the economic activity because of the equation between capital and performance, which probably will never be eliminated at all, except in the case of the conclusion for the necessity of a horizon of complete statization of the ways of production, which the problems that this horizon can produce also. No? In contrast to it, we shall try to determine better what could be an autonomous political sphere in front of culture and economy. Therefore, should we be obligated to defend the strictly political claims, which does not express themselves neither as economic justice nor as a claims for recognition, recognizing cultural particularities. In this case, our interpretation would be certainly in vain because we will probably not find claims like these. Politics does not have a place of its own. However, arguing for autonomy of politics allows us to understand why there are social struggles which are not restricted to the inner logic of economic advantage or the defense for cultural particularities. The experience of politics is not far from that one proper to economy and culture. Actually, it serves to both of them in the extent that it aims to impel, to press econom economic and cultural claims toward a certain affirmation of a radical egalitarianism, able to expose the universal function of particular struggles when they are invested with a symbolic meaning which transcends their own particularity. This is a quote of Laclaus on populist reason. If it is the case, however, it is not so clear why we should presuppose the autonomy of politics as a condition to arguing for existence of something like an anti-predicative recognition. As it may seem, that we are just on the understanding of the political field as forming universality of rights, an understanding that would lead us to the idea that social demands become political only when private interests appear as an expression of universal rights that has not yet applied to vulnerable groups. Then we have subjects predicated through the ju judicial to legal announcement of positive rights, privileges denied to them rather than subjects considered in an anti-predicative way. The expression anti-predicative recognition makes sense only if we affirm that something proper to a subject constitutes him or her as a potency of undeterminacy. A consideration that led us with a fundamental question, you know, how do we recognize politically such potency that does not predicate itself? In order to consider the possible condition of such recovering, we must think about what really means to affirm the necessary existence of an anti-predicative dimension of recognition. In our case, it means an attempt to develop strategies of recognition that can avoid mechanisms of institutionalization. And I'd like to finish with this topic. Such strategies will propose a radical deinstitutionalization in which we will atrophy the law. 
rather than extend its influence on social experience. This topos of a life beyond the sphere of rights, so present, for example, in Giorgio Agamben's reflection on a possible form of a destituent power, could be absorbed by a theory of recognition able to open fundamental space to read the decibel experience of subjective indetermination and their political consequence. In fact, when somebody expresses such ideas, some people consider it as an unserious form of liberalism, as if we would repeat the sound of the old mantra, less state intervention. Consequently, the institutionalizing would mean let society free to create ways of life, closing the eyes for experience of oppression and economic vulnerability. However, we can think this in another way. We can say that deinstitutionalizing means to create something like zones of cultural indifference. That is, zones in which society exercises its indifference to cultural difference and their anthropological determinations. This may pass, for example, by the withdrawal of legislation on customs, family, and self-determination, while we seek to strain, strengthen the legal sensitivity to process of economic spoliation, to recognize problems of redistribution as problems that require being addressed in their specificity, serves here not to defend modes that they should be subjected to the same logic that the very cultural difference issues. Which brings us to the phrase, strong regulation of economy, economic relations, and weak regulation of social relations, of bio, let's say biopolitical questions. We could even say that the problem of redistribution should be profoundly regulated within the legal system to ensure that the recognition process can develop into a zone of indifference in which law becomes inoperative. Well, the idea of the of process of the institutionalization able to create zones of indifference surge from an admittedly heterodox appropriation of Marx's consideration on class struggle and the proletariat. Those concepts allow us to open the space for forces of de-differentiation in the political scene. This force is fundamental to the production of political subjects and appears in its productive potency only through the retracting of the sphere of rights. Actually, it is the retracting that allows the indifferent production of singular way of life. At this point, a paradig paradigmatic example is elucidative here. For example, I would like to remember, let's say, I'd like to propose an example, example about the deinstitutionalization of marriage. Fair questions relating to the expansion of rights to homosexual marriage, for example, permits our contemporary societies in order to protest for equalitarian juridical dispositions in respect of the existing civil rights for marriage. However, let's say a more consistent approach really should radicalize such demand, stating that the state simply failed to legislate on the form of marriage, keeping up to legislate exclusively on the economic relations between couples or other forms of affective groups. It would be a radical mode to conceive the principle of opening the marriage to other social patterns distinct from the disciplinary structure of the heterosexual bourgeois family and its biopolitical mode of governed life. In spite of state extend law to other cases that it do not deal with, as the homosexual ones, we should just eliminate the law, creating a zone of deinstitutionalized indifference. 
The classical counter-argument consists to say that state would abandon the more vulnerable people, as women presented in the example, if this institution do not legislate no more on marriage. However, this is a ma major problem here. In spite to legislate its own questions, such as economic relations of the family, or the legal separation of the state, the pension bills, etc., the state legislates on questions out of its competence, like the form of the effective choice of the subjects, that is the particular flexibility proper to ways of life in constant mutation and production. Actually, the juridical dispositive of the state shall legislate of in on questions of economic order in spite of questions of the affective field. However, marriage is not, or I, sh I hope, is not simply an economic contract. It is, or should be at least, the recognition of affective binds produced as particular expression of the affective circuits proper to emancipated subjects. In the sense, state can legislate on restricted economic questions on marriage or other forms of stable relationship, keeping silence on what form this relationship should have, if between men and women, two women or two women and one man, etc. That is, in reference to affective forms, juridical, legal, dispositive, are not able to predicate the multiple forms of possibility, but it absorbs the multiple effectiveness of the possibilities. According to the juridical perspective, such multiplicity shall be undistingu undistinguishable. That is, thank you so much. Mm -hmm.